nations are groaning under high cost of living, intensified by soaring debt, food scarcity, unemployment, and of course, struggling economies. We are giving our best in the struggle to overcome these immense challenges. Firstly, our robust endeavors to implement a radical socioeconomic transformation is intended to provide sustainable solutions to our cost of living, food security, scarcity, unemployment, and poverty challenges. Secondly, we have historically, and even now stand ready to lend our hand to our neighbors and regional brothers and sisters experiencing conflict and instability, and take a stand for peace, security, and development in not just our neighborhood, but across the globe. Further, we join the global community in combating existential threats to humanity in the form of conflict, terrorism, poverty exclusion, and of course the triple planetary crisis of pollution, loss of diversity, and climate change. In all this and other endeavors, we must also invoke our collective faith as a nation and congregate before the throne of mercy and seat of grace in order that our effort may be blessed with success and that our unity, cohesion, and solidarity be elevated to a divine communion, solemn fellowship, and sacred fraternity of all our people. Colossians 3.13 remind us to bear with each other and to forgive one another. On this day of prayer, I call your attention to the important need for a shared understanding of all the causes we hold dear and are willing to defend. Without this understanding, we end up fighting each other instead of fighting for our causes. Without this understanding, we end up divided when we should be united. I want to remind all of us leaders about the expectations that the people of Kenya have, that we love our country dearly and will do our part individually and collectively to make Kenya work and succeed in promoting the well-being, the dignity, and the liberty of all our people. We are expected to be united by the vision of a strong, secure, prosperous Kenya, where our people live in prosperity, freedom, and happiness. These are proper and legitimate expectations. I will go further and propose that although our ideas concerning the means, strategies, and policies of achieving this vision may differ, we must remain cognizant of a line no one should ever cross, of wishing that this nation fails or that her people suffer, just to vindicate our politics. Neither can we pursue an agenda of sabotage for political advantage. Democracy is a defined political gift, which enables us to compete vigorously, as we always do, but also empowers us to reconcile our aspirations and recognize the fundamental unity of our truest aspirations in a single vision for a free, strong, prosperous, united, and secure nation. This vision cannot admit the weaponization of political differences to punish the vulnerable, prejudice the innocent, injure the hardworking, and afflict the struggling. Pursuit of political aspirations must also enhance justice, not undermine it, expand freedom, not constrict it, and must increase democracy, freedom, and security and not promote autocracy, tyranny, impunity, destruction, or fear. Isaiah 118 reminds us to reason together. 
Today, we are in the midst of a robust national conversation about public policies. Our democratic culture has endowed us with a rare opportunity to reason together and reconcile with our current realities. We all agree, seated here, members of parliament from all sides, leaders from all sides, that we have five million of our young people out of school without jobs. 800,000 young people join them in the labor market every year. I was looking at the budget last night. 628 billion will be spent in the education of our children in this year's budget, from primary school all the way to our universities. Yet, it is important for us to figure out how this investment will yield results for us as a nation. We all agree that our manufacturing, which we anticipated would go from 9% to 15%, has instead gone backwards to 7%. And we need to put policy interventions like the ones of promoting our uh, manufacturing uh, endeavors, making sure that we provide opportunities and interventions to promote manufacturing. We are all agreed that our exports as a percentage of GDP have come down from 28% to 10%. We need to do something about it. We need to promote, we need policy interventions that will encourage our exports. We all agree that seven million Kenyans today live in informal settlements, suffer the indignity of living in settlements that do not have adequate water, do not have adequate sanitation. They are our brothers and sisters. We all agree that our agricultural land is threatened by subdivision and food insecurity is a reality. That is why we have a conversation about the high cost of living. We need to do something about it. We all agree that borrowing is not the way out of our current situation, that our debt has increased from about four trillion to nine trillion in five, six short years. We must reconcile ourselves to that truth. So, as we participate in this important debate on the finance bill, let us ask God to open our eyes and enable us clearly see the real choices that we have to make. And I want to remind you the words of Daniel 11.32 that say, even in the context where we are, Daniel reminds us that but those who know their God, they will be strong and they will do great exploits. Living within our means require us to work with what we have. You remember Moses. He was confronted with a situation. God asked him, what do you have in your hand? And you know what he had in his hand. You also remember Jesus asked his disciples when they were confronted with a situation of feeding 5,000 people. Jesus asked the young man and the lady, what do you have in your hand? We are at the threshold of great transformation and in a moment which demands singular courage. Our commitment is under test. Only bold decisions will enable us to make the best of this opportunity to unlock the possibilities of the Kenya we all want for ourselves and for our children. It is time to be bold and brave. 
delay tactics and sabotage are written in the shaky handwriting of cowards. Excuses are the nails used to construct Let us also be reconciled to our collective aspirations in order for us to live up to the true promise of this moment and our common destiny. I listened to my brother Michael Hastings very carefully and he spoke to our hearts. And let me say, if you don't remember anything he said, if you don't remember anything that I have said, if you don't remember anything that was said by anybody, please just remember his words. He said, if you feel pain, you are alive. But if you feel the pain of others, you are a human being. I mean, if there is one thing that he has told us, that is profound in what I heard him speak. If we all feel the pain of what it is that we have to do, then we are alive. But if we feel the pain of others, then we are human beings. I want us to ask ourselves, if we feel the pain of the 3%. Then it's because we are alive. But if we feel the pain of the millions of young people who are looking for a job, if we feel the pain of the 7 million Kenyans who live in indignity in slums, then we are human beings. say one more thing because I don't want to preach. Let me say just one more thing. Lord Michael Hastings also told us about this occasion of what was called the amazing shot by this great photographer, Kelvin Carter, of uh, this person, this child confronted by a vulture, it was a moment. But he walked away. And it, he never remained the same. You heard that he committed suicide. As leaders, we know we witness every day millions of our young people confronting us in our markets, in villages, in our streets. We all travel the 1,411 informal settlement slums in Kenya. We see those people. Let us not do what Kevin Carter did. Let us not take photographs of them. Let us not take selfies of them and walk away. Let us do something about their situation. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am truly, truly happy to be here this morning. We look forward to this coming together of all of us leaders going into the future. And I wish our great leaders in parliament the very best as they continue to put us together in this prayer breakfast. God bless you.
Thank you, Excellency. Uh, just before I call uh, the Speaker of Senate, the Honorable Kingi, who was also my classmate at the university and at the law school, and also went to Alliance High <laughs> School. Uh, I really like to thank you. I really like to thank the speakers from the counties for bringing along the children you saw here. Jesus said, "Bring the children to me." That is the future of the country. I really want to thank the speakers that have seen the children from Makueni here, where I represent as a Senate. Uh, Your Excellency, we also have student leaders and a program called Air.